Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, now we're going to get into long-term stroke priorities. Thanks for hanging with me. I know that this neuro lecture has been a little bit all over the place and I keep adding, moving, changing, or moving around things, but um, hopefully it's starting to make sense. Um, to kind of sum up so far, we have people um, that um, either get clots or start bleeding in their brain, which leads to decreased flow. And that decreased flow leads to brain cells to die, which can lead to some very serious things. So we've talked about how acute stroke, you know, when they're in the hospital, we're really hyper-focused on uh, making sure their intracranial pressure stays stable and it doesn't get too high. We're protecting their airway, making sure it stays patent. Um, we're making sure that they're supported in their ABCs. We're trying to um, if they have a clot in their brain, we're trying to bust it either through medications like TPA or going in, um, going to the cath, uh, not the cath lab, excuse me, going to interventional radiology and um, doing a procedure to remove that clot. And then we're also going to, um, uh, you know, long term, you know, we usually put these patients on antiplatelets for the rest of their life. Um, and then if they've had a hemorrhagic stroke or a bleeding stroke, then we're going to manage their blood pressure, not give them anything else that's going to make them bleed, um, give them medicines for spasm if they have an aneurysm, um, they can clip or coil if they have an aneurysm or do other procedures, just depending on the cause of the bleeding. Um, so, but um, that is the acute period, you know, and there's a lot more there, but hopefully I summed it up well. And if you don't like any of these videos or if these are like really confusing to you, they have some updated information. So I think it's helpful, but I also do have a stroke series from before. Um, so if you find that more helpful, please go back and watch it. Maybe it'll be more organized or maybe I'm just crazy in my head and it's perfectly organized. Fine. I just, there gets to be a certain time. I think after I make so many of these videos where I start to feel like I'm really confusing, but then students say, oh, like, yeah, no, you broke it down really well. But I'm like, to me, like in my own perspective, I sound crazy. But anyway, um, now we've talked about, you know, acute stuff. We're going to get into long-term. So patients have the acute period, like it's the first couple day or two. Um, and then we're starting to get into like long-term, how are we going to manage them? Most of these patients, even if we get them treatment, they may have not that many or few deficits, but most of them still have some sort of deficit or recovery period. They may need rehabilitation. Um, so now instead of looking at like, what am I going to do first? We're looking at how can I make it better? Um, how can I prevent complications and how can I improve this person's quality of life? Um, <clears throat> so with that in mind, we are going to get into chronic deficits. And the first one we're going to talk about is mobility. Um, and by the way, if it looks funny, I put my actual glasses on. So these are not my cool like blue light ones. These are actual glasses and I am blind as a bat. So if I look like a granny, it's because like these are like literally so thick, like they extend past the rim and stuff like that. So this is how cute I look at night. Like if you're ever wondering what like I look like, uh, well, that'd be really weird. I was going to say, if you ever wonder if I look like what I sleep, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> I do not look good. Um, but if you ever wondering what I look like without my um, other glasses and stuff on, um, which now I now I really should just shut up because I'm like, why would any student like ever sit around and be like, I wonder what she looks like in her glasses. <laughs> anyway, I want to shut up, but I'm um, just in case the reflection is weird. Let me just put it that way. In case the reflection is weird, um, uh, this is why. Or if it looks like something's weird with my glasses, it's because these are actually like, like I would think of them like bifocals. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick with that and let's just back up and pretend this whole awkward moment didn't just happen <laughs> story of my life. Um, but anyway, so let's talk about stroke mobility issues. So, um, issues that they, people can have around mobility after a stroke, um, you have to think about where do you have muscles in your body? And we just learned about musculoskeletal. Um, and so with that, um, there's muscles everywhere, you know, in our body. So most people would think muscles, like muscles, like arms and legs, you know, like how strong a patient is. And that is part of it because remember they have that hemiplegia or one-sided weakness or paralysis. Um, and, um, the other thing is, is though, is the other muscles are affected, the muscles in their mouth, their tongue, their throat, um, which affects the ability to swallow, the ability to speak. Um, it affects their ability to have a gag reflex. Um, but these things also can affect their ability to care for themselves. So there's a lot here. Um, first, I'm going to get into more of the physical mobility, like the musculoskeletal, like the, I don't even say musculoskeletal, like um, extremity strength. We're going to talk about that first, then we'll get into some of the others. Um, so there's a lot of terminology with stroke. I'm going to tell you a couple um, terms here. So this is one thing, like if you struggle with terminology, you may want to put this on some of these on your note card because it may help you. 
versus akinesia. Um, and A means without, and like kinesthetic means movement. So without movement. Um, so akinesia is like an ab absence or uh, of like normal motor function or impaired muscle movements. Um, and so with this, um, you know, effectively what's happening is, is that the patient may be unable to move or there may be, um, <clears throat> they're not moving the same way that they used to be able to is an easy way to say it, easier way to say it. Um, there's a taxi, which I talked about in another video, which is um, that like when I talked about the NIH, where we check for a taxi, we check for coordination. Um, so I always remember a taxi, you need a taxi to get around. So a taxi is like a drunk walk. Like, so people with a taxia, they literally walk around, like they have no coordination and they struggle with balance a lot. Um, and some people may say like, even without a drink that they're a little ataxic, that's me. Um, but you know, such is life. Um, then there's hemiplegia, which that's one-sided um, paralysis. You may also see the word hemiparesis. It's usually hemiplegia usually means that it's completely flaccid on one side, but it can just be weak. Hemiparesis usually me is more talking about the weakness um, or um, like a change in um, sensory function. Um, but just know this, we're not going to give you anything too tricky. Usually it's going to be hemiplegia, but just know that these words are sometimes used interchangeably, but usually hemiplegia refers to complete flaccid on one side, or paresis means just like a weakness. So I have scenarios kind of throughout this that will help you in order to um, um, kind of bring together and put into like more of a reference of like what kind of questions um, or thing or what kind of questions might be around the care for this specific long-term priority. So this question says a nurse is repositioning a client with right-sided hemiplegia and foot drop in the bed. So I'm going to get back here. This is good practice to kind of back up and remember um, other things that we've learned already about. So right-sided hemiplegia, that means I'm weak in my body. Remember, plegia is paralysis on my right side. So if the right side of my body is weak, what side of my brain do I have my stroke? The left. So remember, it's always opposite left brain, right side. And if you remember, all that's left is emotion. So just as you know, this is a good way to kind of practice and remember in your brain, someone who's had a left-sided stroke, they're going to have a right-sided weakness, right? Sorry, left brain, right body weakness. Um, and so, um, oh, let's come back here. Um, so um, with this patient, remember, they're like very emotional. They don't communicate well. Um, they want like, not because they don't want to, but they don't communicate well because they can't. Um, and um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, what devices may they use when repositioning? Okay, I was just reading this. So um, I was just reading the question real quick. Um, so this patient, um, overall, they're going to be um, like, what I'm expecting based on this question is that they are flaccid on their right side. Um, and they have foot drop. And foot drop is, if you remember with musculoskeletal, that's like where their foot gets uh, the plantar flexion, where it's um, kind of stuck in that outward position. Um, it doesn't have the, like the ability to sit upright or to keep the same, um, the correct posture. Um, <clears throat> so what devices might we use for this patient when we're repositioning them? I know that, by the way, that this question wasn't asking all of that, but I was just telling you, like, this is how I study, um, or like learn things is I try to like use every opportunity when I'm reading something to like apply other concepts. It really helps to bring things together. So what devices, um, can I also like real quick, last thing I promise, um, is that, uh, like if I'm reading like practice questions and stuff, I try to read, like since I have the time to, when I'm practicing to like read the question and things like that, I try to break down every part of the question or remind myself of terminology or study every part of it. Or, you know, like I pretty much can take one question and make it into a bunch of different questions. And that's really the great thing is instead of needing like 5,000 questions, you could take a few questions and make them into a lot of questions. So anyway, um, so what devices are we going to use? So if I have weakness on my right side, um, and I'm not able to keep my foot up. I'm going to need something to help support for posture and positioning in that foot. And then I'm also going to need um, something to support that side, the right side. Um, so with these patients, if they're flaccid, we usually, we don't want them to get any sort of contraction. We usually like it elevated to decrease swelling. Um, if they don't have um, any sort of, uh, what do you call it? Um, if they do not have any sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, not tone, maybe tone, like they don't have any sort of tone or um, 
I don't want to say posture, but I think tone is probably the best word. If they don't have any tone in their hand, too, we'll usually put like the book says a hand cone. I've never seen one of these in my life. In real life, we use the rolled washcloths. Um, but in the book, it specifically says no rolled washcloths. So make sure you know that for exams. Um, but hand cone um, to help to keep the hand in a normal anatomical position is I think what I was getting at. So I'm going to use some devices to elevate, to put everything in a normal anatomical position. Um, your book says it's controversial whether to use splints and stuff like that. So I think usually most days now we just elevate. Um, we're, uh, you know, watching the skin for there and then maybe putting one of those hand cones that apparently we all have um, to keep a normal position. Um, to, to prevent complications, um, we like we said, we like to elevate them. We like to usually turn them um, right, like right, left and um, uh, right, left, back. So like we like to um, put them in all different positions, but your book does specifically say that when you're turning a client side to side, you want to make sure that they are uh, on their, whatever their affected side is, like their weak side. So for this patient, it would be their right side that we're not turning them on that side for more than 30 minutes. So usually you want to turn, so with this patient, I would turn them left for two hours, their back for two hours, and then the right side only for 30 minutes just to prevent them. Um, I think we don't want too much pressure on that side. So what else can we do? Um, other ways I could support this patient is regular range of motion exercises. I'm going to elevate, like I talked about, the hand cones. And this is what they said. Again, never seen one, but apparently they exist. Um, but apparently you can use one with nice um, couture. How did they say couture? Nails. I know it's not couture, um, but I don't know how else to say it. Like, I, I don't know if, it is, if it's French tip. I've never had my nails done. Um, it's like, I've worked in a hospital since I was 17. I've never been a girly girl, so I have never had my nails done. Um, and um, so I don't know the different types of nails, but I'll just act like it's really super fancy nails, um, which of course a stroke patient would definitely have, um, you know, that would be top priority for them. I'm going to stop being rude and just continue to go on. If you get your nails done, or if I am just um, being really stupid, just ignore me. It's like, and I, I start to say weird things as the later it gets. But the point I'm trying to make here is, is that we want to do things that are going to support like a normal posture or normal alignment for these patients. And so if your hospital has hand cones, those are preferred. Um, we do not want to use rolled washcloths. Wink. I can't wink this late. It's going to look pretty weird like that. Um, so we also don't want to pull the patient by their limbs. So especially their limbs that aren't working. So like, if they're like a lot of times with these patients, you'll note that like, they're going to end up like this, um, like whatever, like if this, if this was their weak side, they're going to end up like leaning on that weak side. And so you're going to want to like, kind of like, um, some people might try to pull them by that side. You definitely don't want to pull them by that side. Um, <clears throat> for their foot drop, we're going to use what's called a posterior leg boot. Your book also talks about high top tennis shoes. Um, if they have those in the hospital with them, sure. But effectively, we want something that's going to keep their foot in a normal anatomical position or keep it in that like, you know, normal like shoe like position. Um, early mobility balance training can help. Um, we're going to use adaptive devices as needed. And then we also want to think about as we're supporting mobility that we want to prevent complications of immobility. So that would be things like preventing blood clots. And you guys remember, you know, SCDs, TED hoes. Um, if they order VTE prophylaxis, then we would give it um, an ambulation as appropriate. Um, we will also... Um, you know, want to prevent lung complications, like they can be higher risk for getting pneumonia. Um, and so encouraging the end of spirometer, making sure they're taking deep breaths. And then they're also another complication of immobility. And there's more than this, but these are some of the big ones is constipation. So if you remember with some of the other things we talked about with musculoskeletal, what do we do for constipation? We start with the least invasive first fluids and fiber, um, and then we'll st uh, fluids, fiber movement. And then after that, we'll add in medications if it's not effective. And if you're wondering like, when am I ever going to learn about constipation? It's coming. Don't worry. And that's kind of a joke, like, but um, bump, because usually in constipation, it's not coming, right? You get it. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop. Anyway, that's it for mobility. And thank goodness. And with such a great joke. I'll see you next for self-care deficit, which apparently I have.